In earlier videos, we discussed how the chess pieces move, but in those videos, I omitted a little bit of information. There are some additional special moves that are available to some pieces. The pieces that have additional capabilities are the king and rook and the pawn. The special moves of the king and the rook are not independent. What I mean by this is the special moves of the king and the rook involve moving both pieces. This is referred to as castling. As we examine castling, we'll see that there are two forms. The special moves of the pawn include an additional method of capture as well as promoting the pawn. So let's take a look at these special moves. Before we discuss the mechanics of castling, let's consider the potential benefits of this move. We consider two general reasons for castling. One is to move the king to a safer location, typically behind a set of pawns. Remember that the king is considered the most important piece and that we need to ensure that it is safe while the other pieces go about their business of attacking the opponent's kingdom. We should note that the presence of pawns is not a requirement of castling. Typically a player will castle somewhat early in the game and the pawns are still present. The second reason for castling is to activate a, a rook by bringing it to a good position. Remember that each rook begins the game isolated in a corner of the board. The rook is a powerful piece, and we have already seen some positions where the two rooks work together. Thus, we often wish to centralize the rooks so that we can connect them, get them to work together. When we castle, we take a step toward achieving both of these goals. Now, castling involves moving two pieces. Both the king and the rook move. So it's not two separate moves. They actually move together when we castle. Remember that the king is limited to moving to a single square in one move. However, when castling, the king actually moves two squares. And what the rook does is move over the king, almost kind of jumping, somewhat similar to the idea of what the knight does. So again, these are very special moves, but it is not such that the king can just randomly move two squares or the rook can just randomly jump over a piece. It's when these two pieces move together in the act of castling that they have these special abilities. If the king castles with the king's rook, this is referred to as castling kingside, or sometimes called castling short. If the king castles with the queen's rook, this is called castling queenside, or sometimes called castling long. In the current position that we're showing here, white has castled kingside and black has castled queenside. By the way, the chess notation for kingside castling is simply O dash O, and queenside castling is O dash O dash O. An easy way to remember the notation is to think about the number of squares the rook must move. The number of O's in the move notation corresponds to the number of squares the rook must move. Before providing additional details on castling, let's be sure we're clear 
on how castling is actually executed. If White castles kingside, his king begins on the e1 square and moves to the kingside two squares, passing over f1 and landing on g1. The rook then moves over to f1, kind of jumps over the king. If white were to castle queenside, the king again begins on e1 and passes over d1, landing on c1. The rook then jumps over the king and lands on d1. Similarly, if black were to castle kingside or queenside, it would be two moves going to the g-file or two moves going to the c-file with the rook landing on the other side. And again, when a player castles, two pieces are moved, but this is a single move as far as notation is concerned and the play is concerned. Now let's look at some of the restrictions imposed on castling. Here we're illustrating a position where white has castled queenside and it is now black to move. First thing to note is that in order to castle, neither the king nor the rook that will be participating in castling can have moved so if black had moved his king and then returned to this original square, he can't castle with either rook. If the queen rook has moved and returns to its original square, black could then only castle kingside, assuming the kingside rook has not yet moved. Castling cannot be performed if the king passes over a square that is attacked. So, for example, assuming that the queen rook for black has not yet moved, nor has the king moved, black is not allowed to castle queenside because the white rook is attacking the d8 square over which the king would pass. So the king is not allowed to move through check, kind of another way of expressing the idea. So... Assuming that the king and the rooks have not moved for black, the only legal castling option from this position would be to castle kingside. Take a little deeper look at some of the restrictions. In this position, the black king is currently in check. It would make sense and seem quite logical to castle kingside, get the king out of check and put it in a safe position and activate the rook. However, the rules of chess prohibit the king from castling to get out of check. So in this case, black does not have any other option. He cannot move to the d7 square he cannot block the check. He cannot capture the rook on e1. His only recourse is to move the king to get out of check, going to f8. Another, perhaps more subtle, idea here is that all of the squares between the king and the rook that participates in the castling operation must be empty. So in this position, the white king is on e1 and could move to g1 to castle, allowing the rook to then land on f1. Similarly, the black king could castle queenside. Obviously, it doesn't make sense for the black king to attempt to castle kingside because he would be landing on top of his own knight. So that is fairly clear. But one situation that perhaps not as clear is white in this position is not allowed to castle queenside even though the king would move to c1 and the rook would appear to be able to jump over the pieces and land on d1. The fact that the knight is still 
in the path of the rook prevents castling queenside in this position. So all squares between the king and the rook that participate in castling must be empty. So in this position, white cannot castle queenside, even though it looks like it would be logical, but is allowed to castle kingside. Likewise, black obviously cannot castle uh, kingside, but could castle queenside. Here are some additional restrictions that we need to be aware of when considering castling. The square upon which the king lands when castling cannot be under attack. This would amount to the king moving into check, and we know that's not permitted. Consider, for example, if white castles kingside, there are no pieces in the way, there are no pieces threatening the uh, f1 or g1 square, that's perfectly legal. But if white were to castle queenside, the king would move to c1, and c1 is currently under attack by the black bishop. Hence, castling queenside is not permitted because the white king would be castling into check, and we know that that doesn't make any sense. If we look at the black situation, black could castle king side without any problem, similar to the way white could in this position. But the other, another situation that arises is the square over which the king passes in the process of castling cannot be under attack. This would amount to the king moving through a check not into check, but in the process of moving, it would be attacked. So therefore, this white squared bishop is attacking the d8 square, and the king is going to pass over that, so castling queenside for black is not permitted in this position. We've mentioned that castling involves moving two pieces, the king and the rook. And we discussed some restrictions on the behavior of the king with respect to castle. We now want to talk about the rook. First comment is that the restrictions that are imposed in the king don't apply to the rook. First off, we note that the rook is allowed to pass over an attack square. Remember, a king is not allowed to do so because it would involve moving through a check. So here, for example, we've got the white bishop is attacking the b8 square. If black were to castle queenside, the king would move to c8, and the rook would pass over this attack square and land on d8. That's permitted. Another point to note is if the rook is under attack, castling is still permitted. Remember, if the king is attacked, the king is said to be in check and cannot castle to get out of check. In this diagram, the black bishop is attacking the white rook on h1. Even though the rook is currently attacked, white could castle kingside, move the king to g1, and then take the rook and move it over to f1, and that's permitted. We talked about how the pawn moves already, that the pawn can advance one square or two squares on its initial move. Okay, that hasn't changed. A pawn, when it moves, moves forward in a vertical direction, but when it captures, it captures diagonally. If a pawn moves forward two squares, it is also subject to being captured, in this case, by the black pawn in our current position. That seems strange. We move the pawn from c2 to c4, how can it be captured? It looks like it evaded the capture. It moved right by the pawn. But this is what we want to call your attention to. There's a concept here of what's called en passant. 
which means in passing. As the pawn is passing over this attacked square, in this case c3, even though it lands on c4, black has a chance to jump in and capture that pawn using its diagonal capture. Take a closer look at this. Here the pawn has advanced two squares from c2 to c4. As the white pawn moves to the c4 square, obviously it is passing over the c3 square, which is under attack by the black pawn. As the white pawn is passing over this square, and apparently moving out of range of the black pawn, it is actually captured by the black pawn, with the pawn, black pawn moving to the c3 square to make the capture. This is called en passant, or in passing. So a pawn that advances two squares is captured as though it had moved only one square. And just like our other special moves of castling, there are some restrictions on this en passant. The pawn that makes the capture has to be on the fifth rank if it's a white pawn making the capture, or the fourth rank if it's a black pawn making the capture. So in this case, the white pawn has advanced to the fourth rank, the black pawn that can potentially make the capture must also be on the fourth rank. That makes sense because it has to be adjacent to the pawn that it's going to capture, that is, on an adjacent file. So the point is that this is the same rank to which the opponent's pawn is going to move when it advances two squares. Now, the pawns involved, again, must be on adjacent files. Here we have the C file and the B file. When we use en passant, we have to realize that what is being involved here is a pawn capturing another pawn. We cannot capture another piece like a pawn cannot capture a piece en passant. For example, if we had a rook and the rook moved, say, from a1 and moved up to a4, this pawn cannot capture diagonally as it would capture a pawn advancing to the fourth rank. The en passant capture is where one pawn captures another pawn. Another important point about how this works is the capture must be made immediately. That is, if I advance my pawn from c2 to c4, black on his next move must make that capture if he wishes to do so. If he makes another move and then later says, oh, now I want to do en passant, it's too late. You only have one option, one time to make that decision. By now, you should have a rather good understanding of how en passant works. So I'd like to present an interesting diagram to you. In this position, there's a subtle restriction that we see. Let's take a closer look. Black has a chance to advance his g-pawn, and that would be checking the king. So if he moves the g-pawn two squares forward, it would appear that white could capture the pawn with his h-pawn using this en passant capture. However, what we see is that that white pawn is pinned due to the presence of the rook on h6. Therefore, White cannot capture that pawn using en passant. Now, let's look at the other options of getting out of check. 
the pawn cannot be captured at all. There's no other piece to do it. You can't block the check because it's on an adjacent square to the king. And the king cannot move out of check. That would actually be checkmate. One final comment on en passant. I want to emphasize the point that it involves only pawns. A pawn advances two squares and that pawn can be captured by an enemy pawn as though it had adva advanced only one square. So it's a very specialized move. Now, We've got a little bit more to say about the pawn. Remember that the pawn is the foot soldier. It's the lowest ranking piece. But a pawn can be rewarded for achieving a significant accomplishment. Should a pawn advance all the way to the last rank, the eighth rank in the case of a white pawn, or the first rank in the case of a black pawn, the pawn receives a promotion. Now this advance can be accomplished either through a capture. So for example this white pawn here on c7 could capture the knight causing that pawn to advance to the eighth rank. Or this pawn over here on g7 could simply move forward to g8 again making it to the last rank. Now upon reaching the last rank, what happens? Well, when the pawn reaches the last rank, the pawn must be exchanged for another piece. This is the idea of promotion. The pawn is no longer a pawn, it becomes something else. The pawn must accept the promotion. Okay, it can't remain a pawn the pawn can become any piece of the same color except a king. What does this mean? This means that a player could have more than the two knights that they started the game with. They could have more than the two bishops or more than the two rooks. They could even have more than one queen. In fact, it's possible, theoretically, that all eight pawns advance to the eighth rank and become queens, a player could potentially have nine queens. Now the square to which the pawn advances is often called the queening square, even if the replacement piece is not a queen. Very often the piece chosen is a queen, that's why we give it the name queening square. And the idea of promoting the pawn and exchanging it for another piece is often called queening the pawn. Okay, we've talked about some interesting stuff here. Let's summarize what we've talked about. We've introduced some special moves for some of the pieces. The king and the rook, remember, work together and can move together in a single move that we call castling. We talked about kingside castling and queenside castling, which is determined by which rook the king is going to participate in the castling with. Remember the idea of castling was to bring the king to a safer square and also bring the rook into the center, making it a more active piece. We talked about some special moves of the pawn. We talked about the en passant capture. One pawn can capture another pawn. The pawn being captured has advanced in one move two squares. And it's as though it had advanced only one square. It gets captured. And finally we talked about pawn promotion. How one pawn could make it to the final rank, the last rank, and be exchanged for another piece. Now with knowledge of these special moves you're now ready to play a complete game of chess. 
What you still need to learn is how to appropriately begin the game. This is often referred to as opening theory, where you apply certain principles to get your pieces into the game. You also need to understand strategy and tactics, which allow you to formulate a long-term plan and also achieve short-term goals. We'll provide some ideas in all of these areas in future videos. So for now, so long.